हम अज्ञान चिमरन दस्या गरन जना सलकय चक्षु उन मेरी चांदी न तस्मै श्री गुरु देव न महा हुकम को रोटी वाचलम हम गुम नंगा यति गरीम यत कृपा तम हम वंदे श्री गुरु दीन तरुणम नमः ओम विष्णु भदाय कृष्णा प्रस्थाय भूतले श्री माते भक्ति विदांत स्वामी इति नामिनि नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेषा शन्यवारी पस्त चदेश तरणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री द्वैत गदार हर शिवा श्री गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Forgive me, I didn't expect to be speaking in front of my God brothers. Yes, <laughs> you're too much of a friend to be a disciple. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> um, it's funny when I was. I made a decision to play the madanga and lead kirtan standing up because just about it was a week or two weeks ago Shiva Maharaj sent me a photo no comment it was just a photo and uh it was here in Mayapur he was leading guru puja with the madanga i was standing next to him with the madanga Govinda Maharaj was standing in the middle with the wampers. A whole bunch of other devotees were standing around the cartels. And it was about 30 years ago, I think when the kirtan. <laughs> and I was looking at that photo and I was thinking, "Wow, I wonder if I'll ever be able to play the madanga like that again." <laughs> so I said, "Well, maybe I should try." <laughs> It gave me a little inclination to try to see it. I can't play it like I used to. I'm already feeling it. <laughs> Anyways, I played it. <laughs> um, as I said earlier, I, I'm not planning to give a uh, a long vyasa puja. lecture today um as i have understood the online vyasa puja has been scheduled for january 15th and 16th and i believe all the devotees know very well how i feel about having more than one vyasa puja and uh uh when i was asked even initially about this I gave it some thought and I realized that maybe I should make a concession uh for a couple of reasons. And one reason was is that devotees had been wanting me to for years to allow them to conduct a vyasa puja here in Mayapur. And uh for the same reason as I just gave I always refused because it was going to be conducted in either Ukraine or Moscow or wherever it was in January at a time when the marathon is over so I wouldn't disrupt the marathon I've always accepted in January <coughs> and then uh 2 years ago I was asked I I conceded. I said okay, I'll allow it this time for once. And then uh and then uh it was supposed to happen on my way back from Taiwan. And uh when I arrived in Calcutta from Taiwan, it was decided because of the problems I was having with my back at the time that I should go straight to Mumbai to the hospital. 
so I canceled in 2019 <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and went to Mumbai for the, all those tests they had to do at th that time. And then uh, last year, I think I refused. And this year I finally said, okay, we can do it this year. So basically that's how this evolved. I've not really thought of it as the official day of Vyasa Puja. I'm not going to give a Vyasa Puja lecture. I'll give the Vyasa Puja lecture in January on the date that it will be held online. And another reason why I conceded is I was afraid what would happen if devotees tried to prepare so many offerings to offer me and I didn't I didn't couldn't conceive of myself sitting and eating it so I thought maybe if I allow a Vyasa Puja this year then some devotees will come and help me <laughs> <laughs> Because, uh, uh, anyways, those were my thoughts for agreeing to allow it this year. And I was hoping it would be small and low-key. And uh, I'm satisfied. It's not very... It's, by circumstances, it's like it, it is what it is. I'm sure there are a lot of people that probably would have come, but when they heard no mask, no entry, they probably said, forget it. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible for devotees getting sick. It's just something I don't want on my head. <laughs> I just don't, I've got enough things to worry about, to think about devotees getting sick because they gathered because of me. I just, I just can't have that on my head. So... <clears throat> Um, so, uh, anyways, but I will say something, and uh, I will believe, uh, or hope to make it something that's relevant. Uh, first, I would like to thank the devotees for their offerings. Uh, I have to confess, some of them I didn't expect. I don't, I'm oftentimes bewildered that anybody has anything they can say about, I mean, I always feel like it's so inadequate in helping devotees. And when I hear that I do so much, it, it kind of bewilders me. And what it really strengthens is my conviction in the Guru Parampara, because uh, I can't imagine how I could give a, even a drop of assistance to anybody if it wasn't for Prabhupada's mercy. Well, what could I do? Uh, so uh, when I hear unexpected statements about how I've helped or inspired or encouraged devotees, it, it does strengthen my conviction in the power of, of Guru Parampara. And... Uh, how kind and merciful Srila Prabhupada is, is that even somebody, somebody who's as unqualified as myself has been given a responsibility to help others take shelter of his lotus feet. And uh, it's a heavy weight. And uh, as I oftentimes explain that it's a heavy weight that can only be carried if we remain conscious of the fact that I'm not doing anything. As soon as we think I'm doing it, then we failed. And, uh, and uh, I'm always trying to be very conscientious about my duties and my service. And I always remember that wonderful purport in the third canto of the Bhagavatam, which Srila Prabhupada said is, fortunate is that person who has been entrusted with responsible work and if he's always conscious 
in the execution of his service, of his subordinate position to the Lord, then whatever service he renders and whatever result may manifest will only be due to his being conscious that he's subordinate to the Lord and it will it will come out favorable and uh, uh, because uh, externally it probably even indicates in the purport it was Brahma's prayers for the creative potency he was speaking about Lord Brahma who was praying for creative potency to execute the will of the Lord in the process of creation and Prabhupada even explained in the purport that externally it may not look good according to external vision and sometimes we're always ready and quick to judge upon somebody's external result that we that may manifest <clears throat> it may not fit his paradigm of success that he considers to be qualified to be labeled as a successful result but we should be very very careful that we don't become a victim of that paradigm because Prabhupada said that even if externally it doesn't appear to be successful if a person is conscious that he is subordinate to the Lord then it will be successful that is the success and uh, uh, and uh, conversely he also indicates as if that something externally appears to be very successful to the old paradigm but if he forgets that he's a servant and he's subordinate even though it may look externally successful it's not really so successful so uh, Prabhupada has really set the standard for success the success is in the consciousness that we render the service and not only did he set the standard by his instructions but he set the standard by his example and uh, we always have that to to fall back on under all circumstances I heard some devotees say today they fall back on my example well now I've been exposed the king has no clothes what's the value of my example without Prabhupada's example <coughs> so uh, uh, <coughs> he set the bar and I'm simply trying every day struggling to uh, to reach for it and realize that as I struggle to reach for it I'm always way too short and it's not Leela it's not like Mother Jasoda who was struggling to tie Krishna up and coming up two inches too short that was Krishna's internal potency happening there <coughs> she was coming up too short and that was because of her hard labor in fact Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur even uses the word Parishrama it was due to Mother Jasoda's Parishrama which means hard labor maybe you have heard this word before Prabhupada speaks about it in the Bhagavatam uh, he talks about Apavarga Pa Pa Ba Pa and Ma <laughs> he says Pa means Parishrama <laughs> hard labor and Pa means Pena I'm foaming at the mouth <laughs> uh, Ba what is it, Baya? Baya. There's, there's frustration. Between frustration. Uh, yeah. Parigga. Parigga. Uh, and then, yeah. then foaming at the mouth. No. No, but then Baya. Baya, fear. And then Ma, meet you. Death. I remember Shira Maharaj used to have a sticker on his suitcase. I always noted it. 
can't remember the exact words. Something to the effect like, life's a bitch and then you die. <laughs> so Prabhupada was talking about Pavarga. And Apavarga means to become free from that. So I always remember the word with Pav means Parishama, hard labor. And this is used in the example of Mother Jasoda. That when she was trying to tie Krishna, then Krishna manifests his Satya Sankalpa Shakti and his Vibhuti Shakti. The Vibhuti Shakti was the inconceivable potencies of Krishna that his Aishvaya opulences and that Aishvaya or inconceivable potency was that as much as Jasoda was trying to tie the rope it was always two inches too short which is inconceivable and his such a Sankalpa Shakti was his potency uh, which is manifest to satisfy all his desires and uh, his desire was that Mother Jasoda wanted to stop him from playing and he wanted to continue playing. <laughs> so uh, both of them manifested and that's why. But then what happened is because of Mother Jasoda's parishama, because of her hard labor, always endeavoring, trying to tie up Krishna Krishna saw her hard labor and what happened is by observing that hard labor of his mother his Kripa Shakti manifested in his heart which is his mercy and his heart melted because of that hard labor and when his heart melted because of that hard labor then what happened was uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says his Svanishta, his own conviction, his Svanishta was that I have to reciprocate with, with my devotee. And he never fails in reciprocating with his devotee. And Bhaktanishta. Mother Jasoda was the representative of Bhaktanishta, which was that she had this firm conviction that, as she told all the cowherd women who kept on bringing ropes, she was, they were telling her, can't you give up and don't you understand the extent of your son's waste? You're not going to be successful. And Mother Jasoda said, no, bring the rope. I want to see the extent of my son's waste. <laughs> so Bhakta Nishta was there. So because of these two elements, Svanishta and Bhakti Nishta, what happened was that the both potencies, the Satya Sankalpa Shakti and the, the Bodhi Shakti, they left. They were gone. And the Kripa Shakti, Krishna's mercy, seeing the hard labor of Mother Jasoda in her endeavor to tie him up, his heart melted and Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains that in the competition between the devotee and the Lord, we see sometimes the devotee's will prevails and the Lord is defeated. <laughs> so, we all have the hard labor of trying to uh, come up to the bar that Srila Prabhupada set by his example. You know, he set the bar. And who are we? He showed us how to always depend on Krishna for everything. I remember recently reading Giriraj Maharaj's book, I'll Build You a Temple. I couldn't have, I was crying. Prabhupada's laser focus for Radharasa Bihari. No matter, no matter where he was in the world, he was just, just laser focused. Why? Because he promised him, I'll build you a temple. And he just wouldn't. 
he wouldn't back down. And when you read, I mean, I heard personally the obstacles from Giriraj Maharaj many times. But when I read the book from cover to cover, and I actually saw details that I'd never heard before, the obstacles. And that was not just the only obstacle. Come on, Mayapur, Vrindavan, <laughs> spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world, his disciples. Of course, Prabhupada never considered his disciples obstacles. <laughs> he was always grateful for even whatever service was rendered. But sometimes they proved to be obstacles. And Prabhupada would not see it that way because he set the bar for compassion too. He set the bar for forgiveness for accepting. He set the bar so high for everything. You know, how can we ever think? How can we ever think that we can do anything without His mercy? Only a fool would think we, we can do something without His mercy. Anyways, I wasn't planning to speak about that, but somehow it came maybe because my god brothers were here and and, uh, and they make me think of Prabhupada <laughs> and, uh, and my god sister forgive me <laughs> very wonderful friends very wonderful friends I can't imagine surviving without wonderful friends I just cannot imagine what it would be like to survive in this world with our wonderful friends. And uh, I thank you for your friendship. It means the world to me. And uh, uh, I have so many other friends. I'm just, if I start listening to them, it'll be listening to them. I, I may not have time to speak anymore. But, uh, uh, they also remind me of Prabhupada and give me hope that I can s somehow continue to endeavor to reach at least some place closer to the bar that Srila Prabhupada set for us. I did have something that I wanted to speak about. I thought about it before coming. It's relevant. I would say also it's just a realization I've gotten I've spoken about it I've alluded about it I've spoken about it a few times I've shared it with some devotees and um, and it's about Srila Prabhupada and uh, as I've told everybody that one of the great blessings Dolga Rangat spoke about blessing for my health I've been able to stay in one place for so long I, I don't remember ever unpacking my suitcase since the 1980s and uh, <laughs> so it's the first chance I had to unpack my suitcase and uh, <laughs> put my things on a shelf and live from a shelf Although I, I did pack it, unpack it a couple of times before it was, but it was when I was spending two months in the clinic. But that's about it. Uh, but another blessing is that not a day has gone by where I'm not listening to Srila Prabhupada. Minimum one and a half, two hours a day. Not one day, I don't miss it. It's like my It's my daily sustenance. And uh, as many of you know, <coughs> I've been speaking for the last, I guess it's over a year and a half now, from Brihad Bhagavatamrita. 
I've been giving a, for those of you who may not know, I've been speaking from, I started in the middle of chapter 3, volume 2. I started to speak about the Vaikuntha Duta's description to Gopakumar about the glories of the Holy Name. And that's somehow, I just spontaneously started to start from there. Some devotees asked, why didn't you start from the beginning? And uh, it was because uh, I had been speaking about the Holy Name for about a month at the beginning of the pandemic. And then I wanted to go into a section with the Vaikuntha do to speak about the Holy Name to Gopu Kumara. So I just kind of moved directly there. I had no intention of continuing. Thought didn't ever even cross my mind that I would continue speaking from Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. But as I began speaking from one verse to the next, and one verse at a time each day, or sometimes two verses, three verses, somehow the thought appeared in my mind to just continue speaking from Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. And uh, I think what have, uh, I've covered one and a half chapters in, in 18 months. What? I don't know how many verses there were, but, and, but I spent a lot of time studying the works of our previous acharyas. Uh, Lagu Vaishnavatoshini, Bihad Vaishnavatoshini, uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and the uh, works of Bhakti Vinod Thakura, and especially Sarata Darshini, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakura. I've been reading his commentaries in relationship to the verses I've been speaking of. And uh, especially uh, Sarata Darshini, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakura, never fails to amaze me. Um, uh, his his view of every verse of Srimad Bhagavatam is so profound. And, you know, I've read Bhagavatam, I've read Prabhupada's books. In fact, most of the Bhagavatam I read was on traveling Sankatan. I mean, I've read them since then, but when I was traveling, doing traveling Sankatan in the 70s, I found myself having to give Srimad Bhagavatam class every day to the devotees. I was the Sankirtan leader. And uh, the books were coming out and we were just drinking deep the Bhagavatam and I was speaking from those verses. And uh, some mornings I even had to cook breakfast and give class at the same time. Because <laughs> that's how we did things those days. <laughs> And uh, most of the Bhagavatam I read first time was on traveling Sankatan. And, and as you can imagine, uh, the sacrifices we were making, the austerities, and distributing books for as many hours a day as we were, starting at 9 o'clock in the morning on the lots and ending at nine in the evening and all we had for lunch was peanuts and raisins and uh, our breakfast was the only meal we had and uh, <laughs> you know these things Titakuna. you were one of those stalwarts <laughs> out there I'm sure all of you were <laughs> you know what it was like it's no mystery to you <laughs> i remember you distributing books in in uh, west 55th street <laughs> And you were always up there, too. <laughs> so, between the austerities and the reading from Prabhupada, it was sort of like the, you know, Prabhupada was, was speaking to us every day. In the Bhagavatam, he was massaging our heart. He was 
holding out you know, his sword for onward battle against the evil influences of Kali Yuga. He was the general. And, uh, and uh, every day he was speaking to us on the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam as our general and doing everything to uh, inspire us to, to read more, read more, read more. And especially when it's, he would made the statements, you know, these books are not just for distributing, <laughs> they're also for reading. <laughs> I remember, I'll never forget the time when the Chaitanya Charitamritas came out in 75. All we could think of was distributing them. And uh, the devotees, you know, we just grabbed the books, we went out and distributed them. And somehow we never thought to keep some for ourselves. <laughs> just the thought didn't, didn't come to our minds. <laughs> and then the next shipment came and we realized that we failed in the previous one. We started building our libraries to read them. Anyways, I'm bringing that up for a reason. The reason and I wanted to share was is that I've read Srila Prabhupada's books. They'll always be the foundation of my spiritual life. But I have to confess, these last two years, I was reading from Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, and I was reading a lot from the commentaries of our previous acharyas. Now, Prabhupada gave us Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur in his commentaries. He expertly wove Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentaries into his own commentaries. He gave us commentaries from Srila Bhakti Sadatta, Saraswati Thakur. He gave Bhakti Vano Thakur and as Amrita Prabhaha Bhashya in Chaitanya Charitamrita. He gave commentaries, so it's not like he didn't give us commentaries from them. And in his commentaries, he has spoken about so many places about these commentaries of our previous acharyas. He talks about the Satsandarbas, he talks about the Lagu Bhagavatamrita, he talks about Brihad Bhagavatamrita. So, my realization that's evolved in these last two years spending so much time reading from Sanatana Goswami, especially Sanatana Goswami and then as I was reading Brihad Bhagavatamrita I had to go back and read Lord Chaitanya's instructions to Sanatana Goswami and Chaitanya Charitamrita because I was realizing how Lord Chaitanya's instructions to Sanatana Goswami. Sanatana Goswami was including everything in Brihad Bhagavatamrita. It was just his elaboration. And everything was like cross referencing, and everything was just. It was just. It, for me, it was like. I can't describe it. It was. Relishable, filled with realization, transformational, but yet the greatest relish and realization has been coming from listening to Srila Prabhupada every day. Because as I listen to Srila Prabhupada every day, I hear how Prabhupada is already giving us, has been, was giving, and has been giving us so many nuggets of everything from our previous acharyas in his books and in his lectures. And I'm hearing his lectures from a frame of reference that somehow I never had before. I used to hear them and relish them. But now they're deeper, even deeper. I don't know how to describe it, except it's the power of a parampara. I just don't know how to describe it, except it's the power of Guru Parampara. 
and because you know to say I love Prabhupada is an understatement but when it increases exponentially because of hearing from the previous Acharyas it's just it's a blessing it's a blessing I can't wait to put on the recorder I can ask Anutama I don't say two words soon as I sit down for breakfast soon as I sit down for lunch soon as I sit down for dinner soon as I get to lie down for my exercises I can't wait to turn on Prabhupada to hear all the wonderful realizations and nectar and even the most simple lectures where devotees sometimes say I know I'm not this body but when you hear it from Prabhupada we don't know we're not these bodies. <laughs> Prabhupada knows. Prabhupada knows. Listen to Prabhupada's talks of 1977. I listened to them continuously, one after the next. Listen to them. 1977, one after the next. I listened to them almost twice now, consecutively. Now there's somebody who knows he's not that body. <laughs> you want realization? Listen. There's somebody who knows he's not that body. I just, I'm on page 240. Harry Sari gave me his book, Back to Vrindavan. I read it every night before I go to sleep. <laughs> and he's really given the conversations, of all the conversations that took place in this room in the last two months. Papa knows he's not that body. Listen to those conversations. And because we know Prabhupada knows, even when Prabhupada says, you're not that body, there's so much potency. Not only is there potency that he knows he's not that body, but he knows who he is. And he speaks about it at the right time and the right place. Like when I listened recently, April 11th, 1969, Prabhupada was having a room conversation in New York. I posted it on my site. I saw how many hits it got because I gave it a good promo. <laughs> now I'm giving another promo. If you haven't gone there yet, you gotta go. You got to go. It's such an intimate conversation and Prabhupada was just unfolding Goloka Vrindavan. And devotees were asking so eager. One devotee asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, well, but we hear about all these things in this world, and you're saying it's if this world is a perverted reflection of the spiritual world. Does that mean that all this envy, this pride, and all these things exist in the spiritual world? And Papa said, "Yes." He said, "But in the spiritual world, there's no disappointment." <laughs> 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 And then he goes on to describe the spiritual world. And it's so, I mean, I mean it's so like, Prabhupada's just revealing. It's 1969. Listen to 1966 lectures. They're my, some of my favorite lectures. Prabhupada speaking from Chaitanya Charitamrita, Majulila, chapter 22, you know. It is to look who's in his room. <laughs> that time and you know everything Prabhupada's saying is for most of them they're still drinking they're still smoking they're still taking LSD <laughs> and Prabhupada's speaking from Chaitanya Charitamrita about the spiritual world quoting Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur and uh, how to become free from 
lust, quoting the verse from the Bhagavatam, hearing these pastimes. And Prabhupada's given it. He's giving it. He's still giving it. And uh, my realization for these last two years by, I guess you could say, digging deep, I have one instruction from Srila Gaurav Govinda Maharaj that I've repeated so many times when I was in a discussion with him and he was so emphatic with me. So emphatic. He was holding up Chaitanya Charitamrita and reading one verse and he said, said the same thing to me, Maharaj, it's all there. <laughs> it's all there. <laughs> he said, we don't stay on the surface. Dig deep. You have to, if you want to see what's below, you have to dig deep. It's there. And you'll see it's all there. He took it to heart. But I never had the time to take it to heart as much as I've had these last two years. For me, it's been a blessing. For that reason. Health? Well, health is either here nor there. But for that... What a blessing. I don't know, I wanted to share that. The reason why I wanted to share it is because I uh, just want to remind the devotees, don't stay on the surface. You stay on the surface, you'll get what the surface has to offer. But if you dig deep, You'll see there's so many valuable jewels. And those valuable jewels are all coming from the lotus lips of Srila Prabhupada. They're all coming. We just have the right have to have the right consciousness to hear them. And the whole Guru Parampara is behind him. When he opens his mouth and speaks, he's carrying the weight of the whole Guru Parampara. It works. It works. This is my realization. Sorry if I spoke too long. I don't know how long I'm supposed to speak. But uh, I think what's next on the schedule? <laughs>